Seafood is one of our last wild crops. Seafood is pulled from a dark and watery world, and it seems somehow unfamiliar and a little bit challenging. Now, all of us have eaten seafood. We probably know that it's good for us and think that we should be eating more of it, but I can almost guarantee you every one of us has eaten seafood that's expensive and was, quite frankly, a little bit fishy. So we're going to talk about buying seafood. The first rule of buying seafood is to stay flexible. When a fisherman goes out, what they bring back is really shaped by fate and a little bit of their skill. So, if you go out looking for swordfish and swordfish is not available, or there's just one piece left, there's a good chance that maybe it's still there for a good reason. Better by far that you should establish a relationship with a fishmonger. Get to know them, tell them what you like, tell them what you don't like, and take their recommendation. You can also take advantage of their services. So, you can ask them to fillet a fish for you or gut a fish, make sure it's scaled, cut up into portions. All of that costs money, and you should expect to pay for it, but my experience is that it's money well spent. Let's take a look at some fish right here. Lined up here in front of us is some monkfish, which we'll cook. I've got a striped bass, a nice salmon, a snapper, a red snapper from Mexico, shrimp, and mussels. I'm going to pull this big fella up onto my cutting board, and let's see if we can decide what quality looks like in fish. The first thing that I would do is feel the outside of the fish. If it's slimy, that shouldn't be a problem, and it shouldn't be a problem because it's that slime that actually protects this fish and helps it slide through the water when it's alive. If it feels slimy, but it smells bad, that's a very different kind of slime, and that's a problem. When we're talking about aroma, the first place that you'll start to notice off aroma is probably in the belly. So opening the belly and giving it a quick sniff is not a bad idea. So far, this fish looks very good. Back to the flesh. It should be firm, so when you press it, it should spring back. If you press it and a little indentation stays behind, that's not a good sign either. That's an older fish. The scales should be firmly attached. If you rub this backwards, if you rub it from the tail to the head and the scales come off, chances are this is an older fish. Look at the fins. And if they are dried out and broken and cracking, it could be indicative of a fish that's been mishandled or been out of the water for too long. If they're nice and moist and full, that looks good. Check the gills. The gills of the fish are where this fish breathes. Now, over time, the gills will go from a deep reddish or pink color to sort of a deep, dark, brickish red or even brown. And as they progress from pink and red to brown, you know that the fish is getting older and older. Uh, it's not uncommon that the gills will be taken out of the fish because they will spoil more quickly. But uh, if the gills are missing, then you realize that a red flag should go up and you should look at other indicators of quality to determine the age of this fish. Come on up here and we'll take a look at the eye of this fish. As eyes age, once the fish is dead and out of the water, they'll become a little bit cloudy. So a nice clear eye is indicative of a fish that is fresh. There's one final evaluation that I make of fish, and this was shared with me by a fishmonger. He said simply this, that when you look at a really fresh fish, it will have personality on its face, and it will look vital on your cutting board. In effect, it will look surprised to be in your kitchen. He said an older fish has no personality, it doesn't look vital, it just looks like a dead fish. And if you take a look at this fish, I think you can get a sense that it has plenty of vitality in it to this day. All right, I'm going to move this back, and let's talk about some other things. Let's say that you don't buy whole fish, but that you're buying fillets of fish. Fillets of fish should be vital in color, they shouldn't be discolored. They should look fresh and moist. The flesh should not be torn. And if you have a chance to pick it up and smell it, it should be firm, just like this fish, 
and it should smell fresh and briny. If it smells bad, that's a problem. If the fishmonger doesn't want you to smell the fish, you might move on and find another fishmonger. All right, let's talk about freshness of fish. It's tremendously important, and there's a very good reason that fish spoil so quickly. Fish lives in salted water, and because it, it takes that salted water in, the makeup of the protein is very different. It has more protein. It also lives in a, a temperatured environment that is uh, as cold as a refrigerator, if not even a little bit more cold than that down close to freezing. So the enzymes and the bacteria that are inherent in this fish have learned how to work at cold temperatures. When you take a fish out of that cold environment and you put it into a refrigerator, it's as if it's on a balmy desert island somewhere. The bacteria start to grow very, very quickly. The enzymes begin to break the flesh down. So you need to keep fish really cold. And the easy way to do it, obviously, is to keep it on ice. When you go shopping for fish, make a point of buying your fish at the end, and if you can take a little cooler with you with some blue ice, that makes good sense. As a rule of thumb, every hour that a fish spends at room temperature has shortened its shelf life by an entire day. That's significant. So that beautiful red snapper, I took it into the kitchen and I filleted it, and here it is right here. When I smell it, it smells fresh and briny. There is no fishiness about this at all. One thing I'd like to mention, when I moved this fish onto the cutting board so that I could fillet it, I was very careful to hold it almost like a baby, a hand under each end. This fish spends its entire life bobbing around in water and never feels the effect of gravity. So the, the meat, the muscles, and the skeletal system are very different. Uh, if I'm too rough with it, the flesh can tear, the bones can pull apart. If I made the mistake of grabbing this fish by the tail and holding it up and wiggling it, I would feel the spine pull apart and I would know that the meat would be torn. All right, I'm going to take a piece of this fish. Because it's so beautiful and because it's so fresh, we're going to make this into ceviche. And with ceviche, freshness counts. So make sure that you evaluate the fish for freshness. Nice and vital, no fishy smell whatsoever. When you're making ceviche, we're going to cook this in acidity. The acidity we're gonna be using is lime juice, and what will happen is the fish will turn opaque as soon as it gets into the lime juice, and then over the next 10 minutes or so, that opaque fish will carry on towards the center. The larger we cut this, the longer it will take to cook. And the longer this sits in lime juice, the more mealy the outside will become. So as I'm cutting it up, what I'm going to suggest is that we cut it in thinner pieces. I'm cutting this probably a little bit less than a quarter of an inch thick. And once I have all these slices cut, I'm going to line them up and cut them across so that they look about the size of a Scrabble tile. I think that's a good descriptor for, for what we're going to have here. This should take probably no more than about 10 minutes in lime juice. Let me just cut up a little bit more. A sharp knife is helpful. There we go, that should do it. I'm gonna set that aside. We'll line these all up. And what I'd like to do is cut it into little Scrabble tiles. All right, I'm gonna move the board out of the way. And I'm going to take and put this fish up here where we can see it a little bit better. And then I'm going to pour lime juice over the fish. We'll stir it real briefly and give it a chance to cook. I'm going to also season it with a little bit of salt right now. And while that's cooking in lime juice, I'm going to show you the fish that I've had in lime juice for about 20 minutes or a half an hour. 
Uh, you can see it's sort of shrunk up. It gives off a lot of liquid. And if I were to taste this, the texture is a little bit mealy. It sort of falls apart. I can press it apart with my, with my tongue, and that's not what I want at all. So I'm thinking about 10 minutes is all we'll need to keep this in lime juice. While we're waiting, what I want to do is prepare the rest of this ceviche. Now, the right cut is important for ceviche. Obviously, fresh fish is important with ceviche. Depending on the flavor profile you're looking for, you might find a recipe that uses ingredients that are fairly simple and not very full flavored. I like it with full flavor. And so let me show you what I've got here. I'm going to take some onion and we'll, we'll add that. And then diced tomato. I've got some serrano peppers here, which can be very, very hot. So dice them up very small and add them to your taste. Don't go overboard until you're sure that uh, you can tolerate that level of heat. Here are some briny green olives. These are pichelin olives. Stir those in. I want to have a little bit of cilantro for its bright citrusy flavor. Some richness that comes from avocado. And I'm going to add tomato juice to this as well. Just moisten it with tomato juice. Think of this almost like a little salad that's going to have the cooked fish in it. It's time to season it. I've got some dried oregano. This is Mexican oregano. It's really delicious. Um, it reminds me of fresh marjoram, the Mexican oregano. I'm going to make sure that this is seasoned properly with salt as well. And then dress it with just a little bit of lime. Now, go easy because we've got a lot of lime juice on the fish already. And we'll taste this. See how we like it. Okay, the seasoning is good. I like the heat. I love the flavor of the olives, and I'm really looking forward to tasting that with the fish. If you look at the fish here, it's already starting to become opaque. With really good quality fish, I wouldn't worry at all, especially soaked in lime juice. I wouldn't worry at all about tasting it even after five minutes. That's delicious right now. Um, if you make this for yourself, what I would recommend is take a couple of pieces of fish and leave them in the lime juice for too long, just so that you know what happens to it over time. But I think we can move ahead. So we've got the garniture separate from the fish. I want to leave all this water behind. Sometimes people would just build their ceviche right in this bowl, but this fish water and lime juice, I think, should stay behind. So I'm going to drain the fish and move it over. And we'll gently stir this together so that the avocado doesn't break up. And again, we're going to taste everything together. I love the flavor of this, but there's an observation I would love to make, and that is... There is so much lime that it can seem a little one-dimensional sometimes. So adding just a pinch or two of sugar can take the edge off the harsh, harsh lime. There we go. And that should make all the difference. I think we're ready to plate this dish. Let me bring this over. Uh, I've got some tortilla chips that have been fried that I think make a great accompaniment to uh, a ceviche like this. I've got a little glass. I think it's kind of a showy little martini glass. And I'm going to gather up this ceviche and 
add it to the glass. So, ceviche with chips, uh, make sure the cut of the fish is right, make sure that the fish is very fresh, make sure that you drain the liquid after you've soaked the fish, marinate these ingredients separately, don't marinate them along with the fish, and then serve it while it's nice and fresh and make sure there's enough beer. Okay, now we're gonna roast a whole fish, and you might wonder what this is doing here. This is fennel, this is Florence fennel, and we're going to roast a whole fish on a bed of fennel, so I thought that you might enjoy seeing it. I've got the fennel all sliced up here, and so I'm gonna set this aside, and we're gonna get started with a bed of vegetables that we can roast this sea bass on. I've got a hot pan, and I'm gonna put some olive oil in there. And I'm not really interested in browning these vegetables too much. What I'm more interested in is making sure that they get tender. Think of this like a vegetable stew. So I'm gonna cook those onions until they begin to become translucent. A little bit of salt will help draw some of the moisture out. And let's talk fish for a second. What I have here is a striped bass, and we're gonna roast it whole. And there's a good reason to roast it whole. The reason is simply this, that when you cook meat on the bone, it absorbs the flavor from those bones, and it is much more flavorful and tends to be moister. Just the same way I could make a stock from those fish bones, that same flavor can make its way into the meat. So leaving it on the bone makes good sense from a flavor standpoint. Also, if you're lazy, it's nice to be able to take this fish whole and pop it into the oven. But we have a little bit of work to do with it. First and foremost, the fish needs to be scaled. And I would suggest you let the fishmonger do that for you. Just tell him you would like the fish scaled and he'll do it for you. But if you have the fish at home already and it has the scales on it, what you should do is draw a knife or even the edge of a kitchen spoon backwards against the way that the scales lay on the fish. So drag your knife from the tail towards the head and little by little the scales will just pop off. It can be a little messy sometimes so often I will take a plastic garbage bag and put the fish inside and then do this. Uh, I have a few scales still left on here up around the collar. Do the same on the other side. Scrape all the scales off. Here's a few right here, and you can see them popping off as I scrape. Now, how do you know when they're all off? Well, if you take your hand and you run it along the fish, if, you'll, if their scale's still intact, you'll feel them. Um, they sort of catch the edge of your finger, but they're all off. I'm going to sweep away these last few and look in on my onions. All right, just starting to become translucent, so I'm going to introduce all of this fennel. Fennel has a wonderful, delicate anise flavor. And we'll cook that until it starts to soften a little bit. Back to our fish. Uh, take a look at this fish. You can see at its thickest, it's about two and a half inches thick. I usually figure that when I'm roasting a fish in an oven about 450 degrees, that it will cook for about eight minutes per inch of thickness. So a fish like this might cook for 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, it's good to evaluate the fish before it goes into the oven. This right here is the thickest part of the fish. And so this is really what we have to worry about. I'm gonna get this fish seasoned with salt and pepper. I'm gonna season it on both sides with salt, and I'm even gonna season the cavity a little bit, likewise with pepper. 
And then I'm going to mop up some of the salt. And on the interior, I'm going to stuff it with branches of thyme, just like this, a couple of slices of lemon, and a bay leaf or two. And that will flavor the fish from the inside out as it cooks. Okay, I'm going to move ahead. This fennel is just beginning to soften. I'm going to add garlic to the pan. And I want to take care not to burn the garlic. But as you can see, this mixture is not really browning. I've got the heat nice and low. The vegetables are just getting tender. And I'm also going to add some tomato. It's just diced tomato. Just so that this can begin to stew a little bit, I'm going to add some white wine. And we'll add a bay leaf and a branch or two of thyme. And this is just about ready to go. This is the base that our fish is going to cook on. And this can even finish cooking while the fish is in the oven. Um, so we don't have to worry too much about that. What I do want to concern myself with is the flavor of this. It should have a good flavor. It should be properly seasoned. I've added a little salt. It could use a little bit more. I'm going to add some pepper at this point. And we're ready to move forward. I've got a pan that is big enough to accommodate our fish. I'm going to put a little bit of oil in the bottom so that nothing sticks. And we'll take this bed of vegetables. If you were interested in making a full meal of this, if you wanted a starch as well, you could even add some white beans to this vegetable stew. I'm going to leave it just the way it is right here. I'm going to take this fish and I'm going to move it right onto its bed. That bed of vegetables will keep it moist around the fish and temper the heat of the oven. And yet we'll see a little bit of browning on the top. And to facilitate that browning, I'm going to anoint this fish with a little bit of good olive oil. So at this point, the fish is ready to go into the oven. We're going to leave it in there for 15 minutes and check it. And then somewhere between 15 and 20 minutes, it should be done. All right. I just pulled this out of the oven. It's nice and hot. This fish has been in there about 20 minutes, maybe a little bit more. And uh, you can evaluate its doneness a number of different ways. You can sort of poke at it. But where it is the thickest is right here behind the collar right here behind where the gill opening is. That is where the meat is the thickest. And if you take a knife and just cut in there, what you can expect is that the meat will be opaque all the way through and it should separate easily from the bone, which it does very nicely. So I'm gonna take this fish off of its bed of vegetables. And I'm gonna be a little bit careful with it because it's tender now. and move it over to the cutting board. The vegetables look beautiful. And we're going to talk about taking the bones out of this fish. Take a look at what we've got here. The, the tail is starting to get just a little bit crispy. What you may have noticed is I cut the fins all off, the fins along the back here, and on the bottom, and I cut them off because in a hot oven like this, they tend to burn. Uh, you can see how crispy the tail has even gotten. So uh, trim all those away. Now, every place there was a fin, there will remain a little bit of a remnant of where the fin was attached, and you can go in and pull out the bones that would have passed from the fin into the fish. So I've got some right here. 
And then along the back as well, you'll find a few bones that uh, are the continuation of the fin inside the fish. And I'll gather up those bones and take them away. Now, I'm going to take the head off this fish. I'm going to cut through the skin right here at the tail. Maybe even a knife would be a, a good tool. And then I'm going to come in right down the center line and try and separate the, the fish from the carcass. And it should pull away. If it fights you at all, then it means that the fish is probably undercooked. And you can put it back and give it another 20 minutes or so. So let me push this back. Push this back. Push it back. I need to cut through that skin right there. Push this back. And the top fillet is off. Here's the bones on the inside. And you can see I'll lift them right up and they should pull off. Okay, so those bones are gone. Any errant bones from the fins can be gathered up. There's one or two more right there. I'll gather those up. If you see how moist the fish is, it's, it's beautiful. Uh, it smells of the thyme and the lemon on the inside here. And then what I want to do is I want to take this top fillet and move it back to where it was. Move it right back on top basically rebuild this fish. I'll take some of these vegetables out of the body. Those can go away. Some people like the head, others not so much. There's a little piece of meat right here under the eye called the cheek, but on a fish this small, it's not very big. I can sort of dig it out for you if you're interested in seeing it, but... Um, you know, it, it amounts to about a half a teaspoon's worth of, of meat. On a larger fish, it's delicious. On a halibut, it may be as much as uh, three or four ounces. So I'm going to take the head and take that away as well. I'm going to gather this meat up. What I have not done is taken the rib bones out of this fish so that it's not completely boneless, but the spine is gone and some of the other bones on the outside. The way I would like to present this is in the same container that had the vegetables in. So let me bring that back over. It's probably not a bad idea for me to take these few pieces of thyme out. And I'm going to taste this really quickly. What I'm noticing is that the juice from the vegetables has mingled with the juices that came from the fish. And I'm expecting that it's much richer now. It tastes great. A little bit more salt. Uh, you can put parsley in, but I also saved some of the fennel tops. They make a wonderful garnish as well. Maybe I'll put some of that on top of the fish in a second. But I'll stir parsley into the vegetable stew. I'll just mix that in. The nice thing about serving it in a dish like this is that it will stay hot for a long time. Now, carefully, I'm going to come and gather this fish back up and move it back into place. These few pieces of meat will come, and I'll tuck them just here inside. And what I'd like to do is garnish this with a slice or two of lemon and a few of these fennel tops just torn apart and sprinkled over the top. Now, you we could do worse than to have a roasted fish like this with fennel and tomato but I think the crowning achievement is to have a fish like that with a great glass of Sauvignon Blanc. Okay, I thought we should cook some shellfish. Already we've talked about fish and we talked about keeping fish nice and fresh. Shellfish is a little bit different. So imagine for a second you're buying a lobster, and the lobster will be alive. It should be really active. They shouldn't take it from the tank and it hangs there like this. It should really uh, put up a little bit of a fuss. If you buy your lobster already cooked, the tail should be curled, and that will be indicative of the fact that the lobster was alive when it was cooked. 
Uh, In the case of shellfish or mollusks, excuse me, whether we're talking clams or mussels or oysters, uh, these are alive as well. And you have to handle them a little bit differently from fish. If I were to take these and bury them in ice to keep them fresh, they would likely freeze to death. So don't ice them. uh, Instead, what you can do is just keep them in the refrigerator covered with a damp towel, and that should be enough. If you want to include a little bit of ice over the top, you can, but just a few pieces. Now, what you look for when you're buying mussels is something that's very heavy for its size. Um, That tells you that there's a lot of moisture in there still. Uh, I also look for shells that are tightly closed and a little bit clean like this. If you run across some mussels, like this one right here, that have the shell gapped open, that's a potential problem. That could mean that this mussel is dead. So take it and give it a little bit of a squeeze. And if the shell closes up the way this one just did, then that's still alive and it's good. But if you give it a squeeze and it doesn't close up, that's problematic. So all of these are looking pretty good. The last thing I will tell you is this. When these grow, typically they grow in a farm setting on ropes that hang down, and they attach themselves to the rope with a little beard, a little piece of thread that sticks out. Now, you can pull that off or you can cut it off, but if you pull it off, the clock starts ticking and this muscle will die sooner or later. So I usually don't uh, take the beards off until I'm ready to cook them. And you can come in with a knife, just grab it and, and pull it away. All right. What I'd like to do is put some shallots into a pan here. And I'm going to scrape those in. I have a little bit of butter in the pan already, and I'm going to add just a little bit more. I want to sweat these shallots until they're translucent, and because they're cut up so small, it really doesn't take very long. Now, these particular mussels that I have here Uh, are called PEI mussels. They come from Prince Edward Island, and there are times of the year when PEI mussels are not available. Uh, And there's another variety that you can find called Mediterranean mussels, typically a little bit larger. They grow them out here on the west coast rather than the east, and when the PEIs are not available, the Mediterranean mussels are. So, again, develop a friendship with your fish purveyor, and get their good advice. I think that's really important. All right, these have sweated enough. I'm going to add some thyme to this. This is thyme that's been chopped up. And I'm going to put some wine into the pan. And I'm going to bring it up to a boil. We're going to steam these mussels open. And it won't take very long, typically two, three minutes. I'm going to steam them in wine, and that wine will mingle with the juices that come out of these mussels. And there's a lot of really wonderful, full-flavored, savory liquid in here that even if you don't like fish, my guess is you like mussels. All right, as this comes up to the boil, I'm going to take some mussels and move them right over. and we'll put a lid on them. Now, I pulled this one back because I wanted to show you something. Obviously, if a shell is cracked, this mussel shouldn't be cooked. This is dead at some point, something heavy hit it, and it broke the mussel. Even if I squeeze it, it will not close again. So that should be discarded. We'll set that aside. Periodically, you can give these a little bit of a shake. It's a good sign that we see steam coming from the edge of the pan. It'll take two or three minutes, and what you can expect in terms of doneness is that when the mussel is cooked, it will open its shell. So you just evaluate it on whether or not the shells have opened. We'll come back and check it in a minute or two. All right, I'm going to turn this pan off because I think... We're in good shape. Take a look. All of these have opened up. Now, keep your eyes open for any that haven't opened. And there's two possibilities. One is that it just hasn't cooked long enough. Two is that it's dead 
and uh, for some reason it's, it's trapped shut. These I know were all really fresh and they look great. And so what I'm going to do is transfer them to a bowl. What I would have you notice is that there's a lot of liquid in the bottom. And that stuff is solid gold. We'll talk about it in just a second. But first, I'm going to transfer these mussels over. When I eat mussels like this, I like to have plenty of bread on hand so that I can uh, sop up some of these juices. Some people love mussels with french fries. Doesn't sound bad to me either. All right, just a few more. The aroma is pretty impressive here. Let me bring this over. I'm going to pull some of this up on deck. Now, we're going to finish this liquid that's here in the pan. And I'm going to put it back on the heat very, very briefly. There we are. And I'm going to taste it quickly. Um, could be a little more salty. Sometimes uh, mussels like this can be really briny. So I added some salt, a little bit of pepper. That's better. And then I'm going to take some butter, and I'm going to add a piece of butter to the pan. Actually, I'm going to add a couple of pieces of butter to the pan. And what we're going to do is stir this butter into these juices. And if you'll notice, what's going to happen is this will become emulsified. The butter will melt, but it won't melt into an oily mess. It will uh, make sort of a creamy sauce right here. There we are. You can see the butter melting. It's nice and creamy. I'm also going to add some parsley to this. And let's taste it one more time. If you found it a little bit too aggressive with shallots and mussel liquor before, now that we've added the butter, it smooths out and it tastes delicious. All right. What I'm going to do is bring this over and not waste a drop of it. I can probably even pour it on. You want these served in a bowl that's a little bit deep because we want to get every last bit of that liquor. I want to serve it with some bread so that we can mop that up at the end. And usually what I do is I take one of these shells. I use one shell to scoop out the mussel. And as long as they're not overcooked, they'll be tender and juicy and delicious. So as soon as they open, they're ready to be served. This is about the simplest we could do. I could also add some garlic, a little bit of fennel seed, maybe some pernod. I could finish it with cream instead of butter. At its most basic, this is mussels steamed open with white wine, shallots, a little bit of thyme, and finish it with butter. That's about as good as it can get.